In this video, you'll be learning about this topic. So let's fast forward. Let's say that Bitcoin's successful. What does a yield curve look like in the future? I think it'll mirror other upward sloping yield curves. The theory behind an upward sloping yield curve partly derives from this idea of a liquidity premium in which you demand a higher interest rate for locking your money up for a longer period of time. So liquidity premiums and positively sloping yield curves are what I feel and I think financial theory also says is the natural state where if I'm going to lend you Bitcoin for a day, I'll charge you 10 basis points. But if I'm going to lend it to you for five years, I'm going to charge you 15% or something like that. The shape of the yield curve, how steep it is, I think it's very very premature to start speculating about that stuff. I've played around with yield curves in Bitcoin and it's not a great exercise because there aren't that many data points and there isn't that much liquidity at each data point. So making sense of the shape of today's Bitcoin yield curve, it's not a very useful exercise to me. Neither is speculating what it will look like in the future in terms of where the rates will be. But upward sloping, Yes, maturities all the way from one minute to 100 years, probably. And watching those instruments develop will be very important for a transfer of denomination from fiat currencies to the world of Bitcoin. And we don't really see that happening today in any size where we have fixed income instruments denominated in Bitcoin and a like a securitized yield curve, meaning you know, a yield curve with instruments that are treated like securities with a high degree of transparency, liquidity. None of that stuff really exists in Bitcoin yet. It's more of a maybe a next five years building out that true capital market. But the more native, small, natural money markets like Lightning Network, or there's a market for liquidity dedicated to this pool of capital that routes payments, that's already starting. And the size you know, isn't really there to attract what we think of as capital market size, but the ideas are there, they're starting, and those type of native Bitcoin ideas will be foundational in how we think about Bitcoin-denominated interest rates and risk. When you look at the derivatives market today for Bitcoin specifically, it seems like the spreads that a person could farm, the yields that a person could farm by going long and short at the same time and just kind of capturing that spread for an immediate return, it seems like it's really wide and that you don't have a lot of participants stepping in from traditional finance in order to just capture this spread that's, you know, I'm calling it risk free. I'm sure there's some minor, small risk that's being incurred through the the short custodial period that's taking place. But for all intents and purposes, it seems like a massive yield that could be captured that you know, your traditional Wall Streeters aren't taking advantage of. How are you seeing that? So arbitrage exists for the people that are willing to make that bet. You know, My favorite example of arbitrage are the buyout arbitrageurs, where a company gets bought for $35, the stock rallies to $34 and 75 cents. Um, a hedge fund comes in, buys all the shares and makes a quarter when the buyout closes. And that arbitrage opportunity is there. They take it. And you know there are people that are willing to make that market and take that risk. Well, the same degree of ease of closing that arbitrage isn't there for enough people to be comfortable with yet. And that's why the spread is as wide as it is, because the comfort in executing, or let's just say the confidence that you can close on the arbitrage opportunity isn't well developed yet. And that will happen with time and with enough participants that trust each other and are willing to move money quickly. And it also has to do, Preston, with jurisdictional arbitrage. So one of the things that, you know, foreign exchange 
traders will do is they'll trade different currencies with different banks in order to make a spread because certain banks are in one country and the other, and there's just a way to capitalize on that. Bitcoin exchanges are very cloudy in their jurisdictions. And that comfort of the arbitrageurs with the jurisdictional mysteries, it prevents closing that spread. So it'll take time. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 